In the annals of American infamy, the stories of several Ku Klux Klan members who committed sinister crimes remain engraved forever. In this revealing video, we'll delve into the worlds of these shadowy figures who struck terror into the hearts of many. United by a toxic blend of racial hatred and bigotry, they perpetrated grave acts of violence that etched their names in a dark tapestry of racial intolerance. Without wasting time, here are the 10 most feared KKK members in prison. Travis McMichael. This is Travis James McMichael, one of the three men convicted in the murder of Ahmaud Arbery. Alongside his 66-year-old dad, Gregory Johns McMichael, and neighbor William Roderick Bryan Jr., the 36-year-old white supremacist was charged with one count of malice murder. That's not all. All three also face charges for three counts of felony murder, two counts of aggravated assault, one count of false imprisonment, and criminal attempt to commit a felony. It all began on February 23, 2020. Arbery, a 25-year-old black man, was jogging in Satilla Shores, a neighborhood near Brunswick, Glynn County, Georgia, when he encountered a white Ford F-150 pickup truck with father and son Gregory and Travis standing by the car. Travis had a shotgun. Another vehicle driven by Brian stopped behind Arbery in the pickup truck. Arbery, suspecting danger, tried to flee the scene as the men attacked him. However, the men cornered him each time. Holding his shotgun, Travis McMichael approached Arbery at the truck's front before a scuffle ensued. Although accounts of what happened next differ, most agree that Travis McMichael fired at least two gunshots as Arbery fought for his life. Footage showed the black youth throwing punches at his assailant, who fired a third gunshot at point-blank range. This time, the bullets caught Arbery in the midsection of his body, leading to him collapsing face down in the middle of the road while Travis walked away. Gregory McMichael, armed with a handgun but not having discharged it, rushes toward his son and Arbery. Brian, meanwhile, recorded a video of the murder using his cell phone from his vehicle. For over two months after the incident, police made no arrests of the suspects. Regarding the motive for the crime, hate for blacks proved to be the most probable cause. Several text messages from Travis McMichael to friends showed he hated blacks and associated them with criminality. Also, he constantly expressed a desire to see blacks harmed or killed and supported vigilante efforts to catch or harm them. Although the men claimed at the time that they thought Arbery was a burglar responsible for break-ins in the area in Satilla Shores, it must be stated that the young man was unarmed and wasn't committing any crime at the time of his gruesome murder. Following a thorough investigation into the incident and mounting pressure from the public after footage of the murder went viral, police arrested and charged all three men adequately. On June 24, 2020, a grand jury indicted them on malice murder, felony murder, and other crimes charges. By November 2021, their trial began in the Glynn County Superior Court, and on November 24, all were convicted of felony murder, aggravated assault, false imprisonment, and criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment. Travis McMichael further bagged a conviction for malice murder. On January 7, 2022, Judge Timothy Walmsley handed down their sentences. The McMichaels each received life sentences without the possibility of parole plus 20 years. Brian, also receiving a life sentence, was eligible for parole after 30 years. Later in February 2022, a federal court ruled the men were guilty of attempted kidnapping and the hate crime of interference with rights. As of late August 2022, Travis McMichael was booked into the Georgia Diagnostic and Classification Prison in Butts County, Larry Webster. In November 1993, then 42-year-old Larry Webster was arrested on charges of kidnapping and robbery. Following a trial, the Texas man bagged a prison sentence that put him in a very awful position. As you know, people belonging to hate groups like the KKK are often taught to show no fear in the face of their adversaries. After all, they're superior in every way imaginable, can never be subdued and always do the bullying. However, when the coins flip and their own evils become their reality, these folks need all the resilience they can get to survive survive the situation. For individuals like Webster associated with the KKK, incarceration poses a tough challenge that can test their personal beliefs, safety, and well-being. As the prison environment is sometimes innately cruel and dangerous, these individuals are often exposed to heightened dangers due to their extremist ideologies, associations with a hate group, and past actions. They often face risks from fellow inmates and potential enemies within and outside of prison. It's a dangerous situation where they usually become culprits and victims of violence meted out at them by internal and external adversaries seeking retribution. 
When victims, only a few of these white supremacists live to tell the tale. Fewer still end up earning fear and admiration while inside. One such person is Webster, who, despite facing persecution while incarcerated, did something surprising enough to change his situation for good. On Wednesday, July 19, 2000, a momentous legal outcome transpired in Houston, Texas. Webster, a KKK member, received a federal jury's verdict awarding him $55,000 in damages after enduring a brutal assault from fellow African-American inmates while they shared a cell. Following the trial that condemned Webster to life within prison walls, and despite his tattoos identifying him as a Klansman, prison authorities still placed him in a cell with several black inmates. This decision proved disastrous, and the one-time predator turned into prey. While in the cell, Webster was at the mercy of his inmates, who wasted no time assaulting him. Court records indicate that upon being placed in the cell, Webster suffered a kick to the face and incurred an elbow injury, which subsequently required treatment in a hospital emergency room. Regarding the reason for putting Webster in the same cell as the black inmates, the prison's defense attorney, Dan Glowoski, cited cell overcrowding and the lack of necessary resources, which prevented the prison authority from putting him in a segregated cell. The jury's verdict held Galveston County Sheriff's Major Eric Nevelo, who oversees the jail, and Classification Sergeant Leslie Hobbs responsible for the damages. It found them negligent in handling Webster, who was evidently vulnerable due to his white supremacist beliefs. Astonishingly, Webster served as his own representative during the four-day civil trial, displaying a praiseworthy performance that received recognition from Gliwoski, who remarked that the white supremacist supremacist did an excellent job, and that the case was the first case he'd lost in his entire 17 years of practice. Although we don't have records of his prison life after the verdict, we can assume Webster got better treatment this time, and that the prison authority did everything to protect him. Wouldn't you fear that further harm to his person may result in even greater consequences than parting with $55,000? Next. Thomas Jordan Driver. This correctional officer became an inmate after plotting to kill a former black prisoner over a fight. On Thursday, April 2, 2015, police arrested KKK-linked Thomas Jordan Driver and associates David Elliott Moran and Charles Thomas Newcomb on one state count of conspiracy to commit murder. The three men who worked at a Florida prison plotted to kill a former black inmate in retaliation for a fight between the inmate and Driver, who alleged the black man had HIV and hepatitis and bit him during the altercation. To discuss the genesis of the conflict, we'd go back to August 2013, when an incident occurred in a dormitory room at Reception and Medical Center, Florida. One inmate, Williams, a tall, quiet individual who suffered from severe anxiety and depression, was serving a one-year sentence for assaulting a police officer. According to records, Williams had agreed to enter a plea of no contest in exchange for a reduced sentence, alongside an order to receive a mental health evaluation and treatment under county supervision. On the day of the incident, this man found found himself in front of Driver after losing his identification badge, considered a prison infraction. During the check, Williams warned the prison officer to stop blowing smoke at him, threatening to report him later. Instead of stopping, Driver blew more smoke at the inmate, who again told him to stop. When the officer continued, Williams furious attacked him, wrestling him to the ground before biting him. Responding to the incident, several guards jumped on the black man, beating him so badly that he required hospitalization due to his injuries. Driver, meanwhile, underwent several precautionary tests for HIV and hepatitis C due to the bite. Although they all returned negative, the ordeal enraged the prison guard so much that he wanted revenge. Alongside associates Moran and Newcomb, all three members of the traditional American Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, he began hatching a plot to kill Williams. However, in a twist of fate, the FBI foiled their plan using an informant who infiltrated the KKK and convinced the men that he would carry out the murder. Getting down to business, the men discussed how they'd kill Williams. One such plan was that they would discreetly intercept him along the road to his house and incapacitate him using syringes with insulin. Next, they'd make it appear he'd drowned by dumping his body with a fishing pole in a nearby river. Unbeknownst to them, the informant secretly recorded their conversations, including during one phone call, when Driver expressed his desire to deal with Williams personally. At the time, the black inmate was being released, and when out, the undercover FBI agent, Joseph Moore, informed him of the plot. As you can imagine, it must have been normal for Williams to fear for his life after learning about the gruesome manner in which he was to be executed. Well, his story never ended the way the 
the plotters anticipated. Instead, Moore staged photos of William's murder scene, which he showed the suspects, who expressed satisfaction that their intended victim had been silenced forever. Nevertheless, their joy turned to disillusionment after they stood trial for their crime, were fired from their jobs, and locked up in the same prison where they planned the murder. Before the incident, Driver and Moran had records of bad behavior in their employee files. In contrast, Newcomb had a history of impersonating a police officer, Russell Cordier. On March 19, 2019, after jurors found European kindred gang member Russell Cordier guilty of murder, second-degree intimidation, hit-and-run driving, and failure to perform duties as a driver, he must have dreaded being locked up for a long time. However, when you do the crime, you do the time, right? That's exactly what happened on Tuesday, April 16, 2019, when Multnomah County Circuit Judge Jerry Hodson sentenced him to life imprisonment with a minimum of 28 years before being eligible for release. The crime that brought Cordier to the spot Spotlight occurred on August 10, 2016, and was spurred by hate. That day, Cordier became, yet again, another white man who believed his race was superior to others and had the right to take the life of someone who didn't share his skin color. Larnell Bruce, a 19-year-old black teen, suffered a gruesome fate after Cordier deliberately targeted and ran him over with an SUV outside a 7-Eleven convenience store in Gresham, Oregon, while his girlfriend egged him on. At the time, Cordier wore a hat that featured the initials and shield of the white supremacist prison gang, European Kindred. According to reports, the Kindred member and the teen got into a fight outside the convenience store in Gresham. Although the prosecution couldn't determine what caused the fight, surveillance footage captured Bruce running down a nearby street and later along a sidewalk in a frantic bid to escape from Cordier, who chased him in a jeep, finally running him over. Three days after the incident, the teen, once full of life, graced the cold hands of death, never to return to his loved ones again. During his eight-day trial in downtown Portland, Cordier never took the stand. His lawyers argued that he suffered a concussion in the fight and wasn't thinking rationally when he drove into Bruce. Also, they contended that Bruce suddenly started punching and beating Cordier without provocation on the night of the incident. However, the prosecution pointed out that no evidence suggests the black teen started the fight, nor did medical records contain any information that Cordier suffered a concussion or brain injury. As prosecutor David Hannon described him, Cordier was a violent and unapologetic white supremacist who openly expressed his racist beliefs within his circle. In Indeed, Courtier's actions caused so much grief for Bruce's family. During the trial, the teen's biological mom, Christina Mines, expressed the emotional turmoil in her heart for her son's loss. You allowed the devil to misguide you and take the life of such a beautiful young spirit, she told Courtier. You took that life from us. Why? Can you tell me why? Although Courtier's eyes turned red as he began to tear up while listening to the woman's words, he refused to utter a single word not even to apologize when allowed to speak. At the time of his sentencing, the man was already serving a four-year term previously received for his role in a 2015 bars attack, meaning he'd serve at least 28 years on top of the four-year term. Jeremy Christian the story of Jeremy Joseph Christian, a white supremacist and self-acclaimed white nationalist convicted of hate crimes and the murders of two men on an Oregon commuter train, reflects how wicked and attuned to evil the human heart can be. Despite the heinous nature of his crimes, Christian's conduct during his trial revealed an even grimmer dimension to his character and person. Before delving into his trial proper, let's discuss Christian's despicable crime and the motive behind it in detail. On May 26, 2017, then 35-year-old Christian fatally stabbed two men and injured a third on a Max light rail train in Portland, Oregon. According to reports, the incident occurred after he shouted racist and anti-Muslim slurs at two black teenagers, Destine Mangum and Walia Mohammed, whom he asked to go back to Saudi Arabia and to get out of his country. With him disturbing, public peace, fellow passengers Sean Ford, Micah Fletcher, and Talisan Namkai Meche tried to defend the girls when an argument ensued. Following a scuffle he initiated, Christian pulled a knife from his pocket, holding it down without the victim's knowledge. Barely seconds later, he sliced the necks of three men, Fletcher, Namkai Meche, and 53-year-old Ricky John Best, also on the train. Best and Namkai Mechi fell to the floor, where Christian stabbed them repeatedly. Best died on the spot, while doctors pronounced Namkai Mechi dead in hospital. Meanwhile, Fletcher survived the ordeal, but not without sustaining a scar running from below his ear nearly to his collarbone. As the records show, Christian had a long history of battles. He'd been previously convicted for kidnapping, alongside robbing a convenience store in May 2002, for which he bagged a 90-month sentence. 
After the train incident, police arrested Christian. They charged him with two counts of aggravated murder, one count of attempted murder, and three misdemeanors, among other crimes, including a separate hate crime assault the day before the fatal attack. Now, back to his trial. Following court proceedings, the prosecution presented compelling evidence to prove Christian, moved by his racist beliefs, committed the crimes he was accused of. In one footage played for the jury, Christian is seen yelling, I'm a Nazi, f all of you. You can't talk to me like that, bitch. I'll f you up. About 17 hours before the May 26th murders, Christian assaulted Demetria Hester, a restaurant worker on her way home during his rant. Hester had asked him to shut up before he responded with, f you, bitch. I'll kill you. Recounting the incident, Hester blamed police for ignoring warnings that the white supremacist posed a danger to people in the area. While you'd expect Christian to show remorse for his crimes following a guilty verdict from the jury, the man remained adamant, never regretting his actions leading to the death of people. The day Judge Cheryl A. Albrecht read his sentencing, Christian blamed Fletcher, one of the victims, for being responsible for what happened because he tried to stop him from yelling a hateful diatribe at two young black girls on the train that day. When Hester addressed the court about Christian's frequent racist outbursts, which punctuated court proceedings, the man, shaking his head, burst into laughter before yelling racist words at her and several black people within and outside the courtroom. I should have killed you, bitch. He yelled at Hester. I should have killed your bitch. On June 24, 2020, Christian bagged two consecutive life sentences with no possibility of parole. Thus, the right-wing extremist was condemned to life behind bars, where he'll remain until death. Sean Barry in April 2019, when 44-year-old John William King became the second and final man to be executed in the 1998 murder case of James Byrd Jr., Sean Barry, now serving a life sentence, once again came to the spotlight. Alongside Lawrence Brewer, who was dragged to his death in 2011, all three white supremacists participated in the brutal East Texas murder of Byrd in what's today one of the 20th century's most infamous hate crimes. Being friends, all three men shared a troubled past life in crime. King had gone to jail for burglary, while Brewer served seven years on a cocaine conviction. Although Barry seemed the least devil among the three, he was nonetheless a dangerous man and King's partner in crime. On the night of Saturday, June 12, 1998, the men were out riding and drinking. While it initially appeared to be just another evening of carefree enjoyment, events took a dark turn, plunging them into the depths of brutality. That night, they committed a murder so cruel and unimaginable that it shocked residents of Jasper Town, East Texas, and the whole United States. So grim was the nature of the crime that then-President Bill Clinton openly condemned the killing while many questioned what brought the perpetrators to such a dark place. That night, the men gave Bird, a 49-year-old disabled black man they saw walking on a downtown street, a ride. Although it seemed they were initially offering him a goodwill gesture, their motive for giving him a life soon revealed itself. The men drove Bird to a deserted country road where they beat and kicked him before chaining him by his ankles to the back of their pickup. Next, they dragged him so violently that his head and right arm were wrenched from his body. By the time they were done, Bird's dentures torn from his mouth lay on the road and blood smeared a mile-long trail. Per reports, police found 81 places that contained parts of Bird's remains. The police, investigating the killings, swiftly arrested the men the following day and charged them with the murder. Whereas King and Brewer showed no remorse about the murder, amid public outcry, Barry remained cooperative, assisting the police in their investigation, pointing out King as the chief architect of the crime, while Brewer assisted in the murder. Furthermore, he claimed he tried to stop the men from attacking Bird, only joining in the murder after Brewer threatened to treat him in the same manner as the black man. At the time, many believed the crime was spurred by the men's white supremacist views. Affirming this, state law enforcement officials determined the murder was a hate crime. Following a tedious trial that witnessed several twists and turns, the jury found Barry guilty alongside King and Brewer. Nevertheless, because he was the only one among the three to show remorse, he avoided the death penalty, instead bagging a life sentence. Kings and Brewers both received death sentences and have since been executed. It isn't clear if Barry remains racist to this day. However, we know that King and Brewer never renounced their beliefs. Once, while the men served time, Larry Fitzgerald, a Texas Department of Criminal Justice spokesperson, said all three were suspected of belonging to the Confederate Knights of America and Ku Klux Klan. As of 2020, Barry lived under protective custody within the Texas Department of Criminal Justice's Ramsey Unit. He'll become eligible for parole for the first time when he turns 63 in June 2038. D.C. Stevenson 
Whereas some consider him a man of status due to his close relationships with numerous Indiana politicians, especially then-Governor Edward L. Jackson, David Curtis Steve Stevenson is well-remembered as a white supremacist who committed several atrocious crimes. Stevenson, who amassed wealth and political power in Indiana politics, bagged convictions for second-degree murder, abduction, rape, and forced intoxication, and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Born August 21, 1891 in Houston, Texas, Stevenson moved to Evansville, Indiana, in 1920, joining the KKK's inner circle after meeting then-organizer Joseph M. Huffington. Before joining the circle, the young segregationist ran unsuccessfully for a Democratic congressional nomination after joining the Democratic Party in 1922. Having some leadership skills and contributing to attracting numerous new members, the Evansville Klan unit became the most powerful in Indiana. By 1923, Grand Wizard Hiram Wesley Evans appointed him the Grand Dragon of the Indiana Klan and head of recruiting for seven other states north of Mississippi, giving him more power within the KKK. With his newfound power, Stevenson did as he pleased, often boasting that he was the law in Indiana. Indeed, it seemed like he was a man no force could stop. Wealth and fame were at his command, and many top U.S. politicians were his friends and on his payroll. However, an incident crashed the utopic world he'd built over the years. On March 16, 1925, Stevenson raped 29-year-old state employee Madge Oberholzer in a Hammond, Indiana hotel room. Not only did he rape her, the Klansman also bit her several times, so much so that the witnesses who saw her after the incident said it appeared as if she was chewed by a cannibal. The young woman, under captivity and with several bruise marks inflicted on her by the Klansman, sought either freedom or death by any means possible. She later attempted suicide by taking three mercury bichloride tablets, eventually dying on April 14, 1925. For those who don't know, the Klan at the time had a public image as upholders of law and morality. However, following Stevenson's trial for the abduction, rape, and murder, that image was gravely strained as many proved that Stevenson and many of his associates were womanizers and alcoholics in private. The scandal surrounding the charges and trial precipitated the swift decline of the second wave of Klan activity. During his trial, the jury determined Stevenson was culpable in Oberholzer's death since his abuse of her led to her in-captivity suicide attempt that eventually caused her death. John Kingsbury, the doctor who attended to her during her final days, testified that the bite wounds Stevenson Stevenson inflicted on her contributed to her death due to a staph infection that eventually reached her lungs. Also, the testimony that he refused her medical attention for her wounds unless she agreed to marry him first further sealed his fate as a deranged psychopath who deserved to be locked away forever. On November 14, 1925, the jury convicted Stevenson of second-degree murder on its first ballot. Two days later, a judge sentenced the Klansman to life in prison with the possibility of parole. His reputation battered, Stevenson began his humiliation humiliating prison journey. At first, he hoped Governor Jackson would grant him clemency or commute his sentence. However, after the governor refused, Stevenson responded by disclosing confidential lists of public officials who received payments or bribes from the Klan. This resulted in a crackdown on Klan activity, leading to the organization's decline by the late 1920s and a long list of indictments against top politicians, including Governor Jackson. Edgar Ray Killen Whereas some white supremacists repent from their old ways at some point in their lives, former American Ku Klux Klan organizer Edgar Ray Killen remained steadfast to his racist views until his death at the age of 92. This man planned and directed the murders of three civil rights activists participating in the Freedom Summer of 1964. However, throughout his life and stay in prison, he refused to confess or show remorse for the killings. So much so, he remained outspoken about his racist views, even stating his strong disbelief in racism equality in a 2014 interview while incarcerated. On June 21, 1964, Killen, a part-time Baptist minister who worked as a recruiter and organizer for the Klan, alongside fellow Klansmen, including Neshoba County Deputy Sheriff Cecil Price, killed James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner. The motive for the murders was to prevent the civil rights movement and discourage other activists from marching in Mississippi. Whereas Killen is famously remembered for the 1964 events, the man is also known as a very stubborn and violent cake KKK Kliegel, who prison did nothing to change. As a matter of fact, Killen's prison record revealed that he received 17 disciplinary write-ups throughout his entire stay at the state prison in Mississippi between 2009 and 2018 when he died. The offenses varied from concealing tobacco within the padding of his wheelchair to using derogatory language towards staff members, whom he referred to as black bitch. Regarding the second offense, Killen once told correctional officer I.V. Rovanda Johnson, you black bitch. You can't tell me what to do. I'm gonna beat your black ass. 
You see, after the events of June 21, 1964, Killen remained free for over four decades without paying any price for his atrocious crime. At first, U.S. authorities arrested and put him on trial for the murders. However, his trial yielded no conviction, leading to him going scot-free. Within the period he remained free, the staunch segregationist lived a life of impunity, never hiding his racist views publicly. However, on June 21, 2005, the long arm of the law finally caught up with him, resulting in him bagging a 60-year sentence for three counts of manslaughter. Then, at 80 years old, prison life proved too challenging for Killen to handle. Once behind bars, where he was surrounded mainly by black inmates, the white supremacist found it very difficult to adjust to a life where he wasn't in control like before. His defiance to obey prison instructions, especially from black officials, led to him fomenting trouble after another throughout his stay at the Central Mississippi Correctional Facility in Pearl, and later the Mississippi State Penitentiary in Parchment. Due to his frequent displays of bad behavior, including using offensive language, refusing to comply with rules and disciplinary reports, and multiple confrontations with prison officials, Killen faced many disciplinary actions, including losing his privileges. On one occasion, prison authorities banned him from using the canteen and the telephone. At the same time, no one would visit him for 15 days after yelling abusive words at black officer Brenda Johnson. Despite everything done to make him change his ways, Killen didn't mind or care to stop remaining a strong segregationist. On January 11, 2018, six days before his 93rd birthday, the man died at the Mississippi State Penitentiary, marking the end of one of America's most notorious racists, Tommy Terrence. Unlike Killens, who died a segregationist, Tommy Terrence ranks among white supremacists who, at the height of their segregationist fervor, realized their mistake and changed for good. Being an operative for the ultra-violent right-wing terrorist White Knights faction of the Klan, Terrence participated in about 30 bombings of homes, churches, and synagogues before his eventual capture by the FBI in Meridian, Mississippi. On June 30, 1968, Terrence, with one female accomplice, Mrs. Ainsworth, attempted to plant a bomb at a Meridian Jewish businessmen's home when police ambushed them after a stakeout. Following the ambush, a bloody shootout ensued with the police and FBI, leading to his companion's death and is being critically wounded by four blasts of close-range shotgun fire. After being rushed to the hospital, doctors told him it would be a miracle if he lived another 45 minutes. Nevertheless, the man survived against all odds, spending over a month recovering from his wounds. Born and raised in Mobile, Alabama, Terrence's difficult relationship with his father led him to see the man as less of a role model. By the time he entered high school, he'd been influenced by a white supremacist neighbor who helped radicalize him. As much as he hated blacks, Jews, and communists, the former racist opposed the desegregation of public schools in the mid-1960s. At 21, fueled by his beliefs, he eventually joined the KKK, immediately setting himself apart with his sharpshooter and explosives expert skills, making him an efficient and ruthless terrorist. Think about this. Most racists didn't grow up that way. For many, like Terrence, pressure from society Society and the need to believe in something led them to join racist groups like the KKK. These folks remain loyal as long as those beliefs last, but flip once they no longer feel any purpose within their organizations. Following his stay at the hospital, Terrence immediately found himself standing trial for his transgressions. Although he contended that the police had opened fire on him without warning, he bagged a 30-year sentence that saw him spend time in the Mississippi State Penitentiary at Parchman. Once inside, life for Terrence was like he once described it, living in a sewer. Just months after entering prison, he escaped incarceration only to be apprehended following another shootout that again claimed the life of another accomplice. Back in prison, the authorities placed him in solitary confinement for a year. Then, in his tiny maximum security cell, the white supremacist began reading fewer propaganda books and more on philosophy and the Christian gospel. Following this, his life began to change for good, and even the guards and fellow inmates soon noticed the change in him. Slowly but surely, the intensity of his hatred became redirected to a passionate hunger for spiritual uplifting. Thanks to his newfound faith and purpose, he soon became a model prisoner and an inmate leader who devoted himself to leading a life outside of hate and racism. As a testament to his conversion, Terrence became friends with several people of color, including former Blank Panther Eldridge Cleaver. Following his release from prison after eight years inside, he obtained a degree from the University of Mississippi and later attended seminary. Terrence later wrote the book, He's My Brother, with African-American evangelical leader John Perkins. Among many things, he cherishes spreading his story of salvation to many. George Malvaney, like Terrence, 
George Malvaney's story is another tale that shows that even the worst person can become good given certain circumstances. First, he organized a clan unit, got arrested for plotting a coup, and did time behind bars. After prison, he went to college and later dedicated his life to fighting polluters before starting a business. In 1980, a group of clansmen operating a U.S. Navy ship plotted to invade the Caribbean island of Dominica and replace the government with a right-wing anti-Soviet regime. Malvaney, then 20 and having just completed his Navy experience, fell in with Danny Hawkins, who convinced him to join the group. Being his new friend and mentor, the young lad, naive and filled with a spirit of adventure, decided to tag along. Unbeknownst to him, the expedition's principal purpose was to set up a point for a cocaine smuggling ring. Nevertheless, the FBI got wind of the plot, leading to an early intervention which foiled the plan. On April 27, 1981, an FBI SWAT team arrested the plotters at a marina in Slidell, Louisiana, and 21-year-old Malvaney, found himself in Orleans Parish Prison by midnight. During a trial that sealed his fate, the Klansmen pled guilty to conspiracy to invade a foreign country with intent to overthrow the government. For his crime, he was sentenced to four years in federal prison. As a young lad whose life's goal was never to end up in a prison cell, becoming incarcerated Malvaney took a significant toll on him. In 1977, he quit high school to join the Navy. The following year, while on leave, he joined the KKK, and later led a clavern aboard the USS Concord Navy ship. As the ship proved unideal for his racist indulgences, Malvaney was discharged and sent home in 1979. Alone and seeking purpose, he ultimately trod down a dark part that thrust him into a life behind bars. During his stay in prison, however, something happened to Malvaney that changed his life forever. At the time, he became accustomed to mingling with various kinds of people, murderers, kidnappers, robbers, drug dealers, and some of the worst in society. Writing letters for many of these people, he soon learned that despite their backgrounds, they shared common emotions and humanity, fueled by a commitment to quit the disgraceful lifestyle he once lived and leave prison a better person. Malvaney reflected on himself, swore to avoid further involvement in illegal activities, and began purging himself of his supremacist mindset. Fortunately, his commitment to becoming a better person helped him maintain a good record while behind bars. And although he describes his prison time as a wonderfully terrible experience he'd never want to repeat, it's regardless one of the most valuable experiences of his life. In October 1982, barely a year and a half inside, Malvaney got out of prison, remaining on parole for the rest of his four-year sentence. He'd later get a college education and graduate from the University of Southern Mississippi in 1987, pursue successful careers, and publish the book Cups Up, which recounts his first day behind bars. If you enjoyed this, click on the card currently showing on your screen for other interesting videos.